Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Thrive Co-Living Communities YouTube podcast. I'm Mark Stein, Thrive founder and your podcast host. We're creating sustainable, inclusive, and multi-generational residential communities. Our mission is to combat the epidemic of isolation, revitalize communities, and help others discover the many benefits of engaged community living by offering unique and ecologically sustainable co-living options. In this podcast series, join us as we discuss co-living, in addition to bringing you interesting people from around the world who are doing cool things to expand your knowledge and satisfy your curiosity. Through this podcast, learn more about our concept and see how Thrive Co-Living Communities will bring together people from all walks of life who want to enjoy the best of independent and group living. To find out more about us, please visit our website at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. Thanks for watching and enjoy the podcast. So hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Thrive Co-Living Communities podcast. Today, I'm here with a returning guest, Charles Malka. Is it Malka or, or Malka? How do you pronounce it? Malka is the Malka. correct way. Yes. <clears throat> um, he's a professor of management at Sullivan University's College of Business and Technology in Louisville, Kentucky, and the author or co-author of several books, including the one that we discussed last time when he visited uh, back in August of 22, um, Back to the New Normal in Search of Stability in an Era of Pandemic Disruption. Uh, he's written a new book called Amplifying Management Research for the Common Good. It has a, a lengthy subtitle. I'm going to let him tell us that. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the long-term impacts of COVID on the workplace and on, and on in business. <clears throat> so, um, so welcome, welcome back, Charles. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, um, what are what are some of the? Let's just jump right in. What are some of the trends that started during COVID? And you know what? Maybe. They may have even started before COVID. One of the things that I've noticed is that COVID seemed to accelerate a lot of trends that were already happening. There's some, I think, that are unique to COVID, but some of those things, for example, the use of uh, video conferencing, like the tools that we're on now, that was going on, but man, did it explode and accelerate during COVID. So. Uh, Let's just start with with one that's top of mind for you. Well, first, let me just just uh, in, in terms of background, if, if I may just regress sure. a little bit. Um, as you mentioned, we are writing a new book. Uh, the new book has hands and legs tied up in this way or another to the pandemic. We, we just we just cannot ignore that event. It is a major, major um, historical you know, in terms of magnitude, and that created uh, ha havoc, literally a lot of disruptions. Uh, some of them we saw, some of them we did not foresee. So when we wrote our first book, Back to a New Normal, uh, we focused on the, on the here and now, so to speak. We did not imagine, because we did not knew, know at the time, uh, some of the ramifications of these of the of the pandemic as we know it now. So our second book, uh, and as you mentioned, the, uh, we titled it "Amplifying uh, Management Research uh, for the Common Good: um, Lessons for Curious Individuals and Organizations," and it is basically based on insights of practitioners in different fields. Um, you know, to it. And in, in a nutshell, what the book is all about is this. There is a dilemma that people are not aware of, uh, unless you're in, in the academia. We do research, we publish a lot of papers. These papers are published in journals, in academic journals, and 
what happened in reality is that unless you're a member of a particular association, you have no access to that information. So uh, what I've done, I took a collection of about 16 or 17 uh, of our studies, of our research in different areas, very eclectic, uh, and made them available in the book as an appendix, the reader. Then we, we, we align one study or two with a particular practitioner depends on the field of expertise and the line of work that they do. What we ask them to do is, here is a study that was published in a particular journal. You probably never heard about it. You probably never had access to it. Well, take it, define a few themes that you can build based on your experience, a chapter around it. Break it down to the nuts and bolts so that people can understand. They, we don't want any a, a, a academia-driven paper, research loaded with numbers. We want you to break it down, take the meat out of it, and then build something that, is, that makes sense to you because of your line of work that will make also sense to people out there. That's what we did. So we produced 10 chapters like that. The chapters are in the very part, the first part of the book. And the second one, we are making now to the interested people, the studies as they were written, as they were published in journals that I know for a fact, very few have access to it. Even if you are an acad in the academia, unless you are a member of that association, you yourself will have no access to them. And what is, has been happening lately, because I also am an editor of a journal, Journal of Conflict Management, is that many universities don't want to deal with the headache of a journal, managing the logistics side of it. Most universities do. They now uh, outsource everything that has to do with the production of that journal to a publisher a for-profit publisher. So the publisher will publish an article of yours, but for you to access it, you have to pay, it, it ranges, it depends. It can be $50, it can be $100 or more, just to have the permission to download a 20-page research paper. To me, it makes very little sense because what I believe in, coming from the business to the academia, um, is that studies and findings have to be available for everybody out there. Uh, we don't have to charge for it. Uh, if, if you're a curious reader, you should have access and you should read them for fun. If you're an organization or a manager, you should have access to it and read them for a purpose. What can I take and apply to embedder the operations of my business? So that is a little, you know, uh, background, so to speak, information. So to go back to your question, um, chapter two, chapter two in our book is exactly the way you phrased it. Uh, and that is long term trends that were created anew or accelerated by the pandemic. And that chapter is available to anybody who listens, Mark, to your uh, to this podcast. Yes. All my papers are available to anybody that is interested, interested in. The best way to access them is to go to Google, Google Scholar. Just enter Google Scholar and then go to the search field and enter my name. And my name should be Shalom, S-H-A-L-O-M. Charles Malka, M-A-L-K-A. If you Google that and you hit the, the send key search, a lot of my papers will, will pop up. And it is very likely that this very topic we're talking about of the long trend, uh, long-term trends of the pandemic will be the very first to pop up because they are, you know, by it's a recent, so it should be at the top of the list. 
and and, and we'll be other sure people. we'll be sure to put a link to that in oh. the show notes yes yes um if anybody anybody is interested in 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 a in a particular paper feel free to email me you can email me at s like in sam s malka just one word s malka at sullivan s-u-l-l-i-v-a-n dot e-d-u and in my response to you in my email there is a link at the bottom of all my emails and that link if you click on it will give you direct access to all of my published papers well many of them not all of them but the, the more recent ones including this particular one that we are just talking so to your question my goodness i in that chapter identify 20 believe it or not 20 long-term <laughs> trends and we build them this way we 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 did we did a group of them under the heading of uh, labor shortage we all know how acute is labor shortages today whether it is your doctor's office or the grocery store <laughs> or i tried to reach verizon on the phone about an hour or so ago and they put me on hold and then they came and they apologized they're short-handed so short labor shortages is felt it is triggered primarily by the pandemic but something that we call the uh, great resignation uh one morning within a, a a period of eight months uh about 12 million americans left their jobs and walked away many of them are coming back to the labor market different jobs maybe the old one if they are allowed to uh we still suffer a great deal from shortages anywhere in airports in the grocery stores in restaurants uh it is very very everybody can feel it everybody's talking about it uh ultimately something will happen and there will there will be again a balance between the supply and demand but right now uh the demand is through the roof and the supply is out there uh and and it creates havoc in the labor market particularly the pressure um for some it is good pressure on the wages uh pushing them up so let me, let me jump yeah. in with a question at this point Sh sure um that i i still cannot figure out there were a lot of people at the beginning of the pandemic let's just say um who needed absolutely needed full-time work um not gig work not driving uh for uber or uber eats or something they needed full-time work and then for various reasons they stopped during covid but many of them who still need full-time work are not going back to work and some of those people are not doing gig sorts of uh, uh labor how how do how are people getting by when they desperately need this income i and i don't know people personally but i'm aware that that is some that's a phenomenon that that is happening what are people doing they are eating into their savings uh the fact that uh, country was on hold so to speak and the economy came to a stop uh people spend less money they were able to to, to uh, save more uh and many of them live literally on their savings and you know when you exhaust them or you get to a point a red line then you start looking again at the job but the interesting thing here is and this is the deep implication at least for management to the way companies are operate and continue to operate it's a wake-up call surveys are telling us that roughly 42 four out of 10 people that came back to work in a different line of work with a different employer uh is extremely not happy uh with the current situation with their employment 
something has to change within the workplace because business cannot continue as it was pre-pandemic. Uh, management has to step up to the plate, you know, and make changes to make the workplace more attractive, more uh, employee-centered. Uh, revisit. In, in uh, another paper of mine, I suggested to revisit the contract between employee and employer. You know, new expectations have, have to be set, set up and so on and so forth. Uh, the management skills, competencies that are required today, post-pandemic, if we can even say so, because people still die from the pandemic, has to be completely diff different than the mindset before. Uh, you all heard about Peter Drucker, you know, uh, passed away a few years ago. He has a very, very uh, cutting edge uh, institution that does a lot of surveys in the best ran companies in America. They have a list of hundreds of companies like that with thousands of C-suite, top, top echelon management. And they learn a great deal about what happened before, what was required, and what happens now, and what is required. The ability to manage ambiguity was never an, a key issue. The ability to have a global view of things was never a big issue before the pandemic. But with the supply chain problems that the companies found themselves in, you've got to see outside. You've got to have a global view of what is happening around to prepare for that because. We all know that it's just a matter of time before another pandemic will hit us. Hopefully, and that was our message in our first book, hopefully we're pre better prepared for, for it. So labor shortages is a very, very, very real issue and real problem. And Mark, you know, they, there are other things that exacerbate that. A great resignation, happened happened in 2021 uh and well into the early part of 22 as i said the total is about 12 million and every month since then there are roughly about 11 million non-farm positions that are not filled every month this is the the office of labor statistics okay so it's a big hole that needs to be filled in and everybody is, is, is filling the crunch. But there, there are a lot of good things that happen because of that. As I said, wages are going up. Uh, another thing is a transition of power, bargaining power from management to the employee out there. You know, empl employees have a lot of power now because of that. We need you. So we're willing we are forced, we are compelled to work with you. Um, there yeah. are other, yes. Yeah, let me ask you a question. Uh, to, to go back to something you talked about, the social contract for work. Uh, let's, let's talk about that for a moment and then, and then move on to other things. But so pre, I, I, I came into the workforce in the late seventies, early eighties. And prior to that, I, I came in with a change of the, of the social contract. Prior to that, let's say post-World War II, up to around that point, um, the contract was employees trade your loyalty for security. If you stay with us and give us your best, which is pretty good, um, you're not going to have to work really hard. You're going to work 40 hours unless you're in a law firm at the beginning of a law firm. You're going to work hard. You're going to retire with a traditional pension and you're going to get a gold watch and all of our gratitude. Um, when I came into the workforce, that contract was broken. And what emerged and it took a while for this to emerge, I think, and I want to test this out, test my theory out with you, is, and, and it, it went into even the millennial 
the millennials going to the workforce is we're going to give you, we're not going to give you security. You're going to get uh, maybe some contribution into a 401k that you own and that's portable. Maybe not. Maybe it's just you will we'll provide you the framework. So you're not going to get and you're not going to have any job security beyond when you're needed. And the the trade off for that is we're going to give you opportunities to learn new skills. We may even pay for some training if you use that with us, but you're trading a your your labor at the moment for an opportunity for professional growth that you could take to your next job because nobody expects you to retire from here. Um, am I accurate with defining those two? There may be some others. And if so, what is the new contract going to be or what is it, what's emerging? Absolutely. The old one was centered around the employer. Company comes first and we demand uh, dedication, final work. And in return, you know, we give you, we pay you, we try to pay to give you increases. We'll, we'll do the annual valuation. We'll go through all the ceremony uh, that, that you talked about, which is correct. And the expectation was that you going to be working at your desk until you retire. And as you said, you know, the big watch and what have you. General Electric. That was that was basically the philosophy of General Electric. Uh, you get a gold watch when you retire. We give you a certificate. We do a little party for it. This is all a relic of the past. It doesn't exist anymore. People are loyal to themselves. They are loyal to the profession, not to the employer or the place of work. The best proof for that was the pandemic. All in a sudden, you got millions of people that kiss their employer, their companies goodbye. There is no loyalty. You come first, your family comes first. You try to max to get the best benefit possible. And, you know, if there is a problem, there is a problem. Uh, I jump ship. I don't want to sink with that particular company or, or, or employer. You are absolutely correct. And because of that, because of that, one of the changes that the pandemic introduced is the whole institution of HR, of human resources. Human resources was always considered a secondary function, a backroom function. It is paperwork driven, it's administrative functions. It never had a strategic role around the table, the decision-making table of companies until the big resignation, hit, the great resignation hit. Companies are starving for employees. They cannot find them fast enough. And what happened, not only the power, bargaining power, you know, in transition from employers to the employee now, an employee has to be paid closer attention to, to what the employ, employee is expecting and what they want. But HR now is a major, major player because they are responsible for the retooling, for the retraining, for the hiring. And mind you, you know it well, all in a sudden you cannot even interview people in person. You use technology, you use Zoom to interview people out there. Gone are the days that the machine picks applications and we are based who we're going to invite for an interview on, on some keywords. Today, you're starving for anybody so much that here is another long term trend is what, what I called here a new color. It's not anymore a blue color or a white color because companies are reducing the qualifications for acceptance for the, the hiring criteria have changed because you're so starving for employees people get promotions people are doing jobs if they stayed with a company that in regular times they would have never dreamed hmm. so there was a, a, a kick up okay not out but up people 
now have new titles, a, a different pay structure. You know, talking about pay, here is another thing, as, as you're aware of, is all in a sudden companies are required to publish their, their ongoing pay rates. This never happened before. You got states like California and Washington and Oregon and some cities like New York City where employees are publishing, uh, you know, their rates, their pay rate and employer are required to do so. This by itself is another indication of the transition of power for employee, for, from employer to the employee. So, I mean, all these dynamics are out there that are telling us that the work today, the office today, the workplace of today, the contract, as you alluded to, has absolutely to be revised, has to be revisited and adjusted to meet the new dynamics at the workplace that are happen happening. But what, so what needs to happen in order to accommodate this? Is it ping pong tables? And I mean, during the, during the tech boom, it was free meals, dry cleaning, uh, daycare on site, um, all sorts of perks. I don't think that does it anymore either, right? No, I mean, I, employers are offering that cafeteria of benefits you're absolutely right but it, it 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 has to be personalized you know it has to be tied to the expectation tailored to the individual it's not something across the board anymore you know it's it just it, it doesn't work anymore you have to tailor it to the skills to the to the the, the know-how uh to the competencies of of an employee it has to be more like that but you also cannot cook things behind closed doors because more and more states and cities are adopting the new policy the new approach that you have to publish for everybody to see you know your pay rates what do you pay for a particular job or a particular role it cannot be in closed doors anymore it has to be wide open. So what is happening is, is uh, a mix of conflicting things that are, you, you, you expect to tailor something to me, to my background, my education, my ex years of work, and so on and so forth, my competencies that I bring to the table. But at the same time, you have to publish to the public to know and see my, our company this, uh, this is the, 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 the uh, pay rate that we have for a particular job. A lot of that conflict is happening. And again, how management is handling this is going to be a key that will determine the viability of company X or company Y. There is so much turmoil and so much pressure going on that is un unbelievable. Work from home is is an area that reflected more than anything else because employers tended to force everybody across the board to come back to the office well because the power is now moving more and more to the employee em employees thought there was a strong pushback and then somehow it settled somewhere in the middle okay you can work from home four days but you have to come to the office a day or two or vice versa whatever it is. So that hybrid model that never existed before in the magnitude that it is now is forcing, forcing, you know, um, a pushback to, to, to companies. Uh, uh, General Motors is a good example where they wanted everybody, white collar, blue collar, definitely, to come back to work. There was a strong pushback from the unions and they settled on some sort of a hybrid that management with each employee will determine what works or both. Ultimately, there will be a balance between worker expectations and company needs, you know, in a form of, of uh, a hybrid approach of some sort. That's, mm -hmm. that's what's happening right now as we speak. Elon had an interesting take on it. He said, you can work at, as, at home as much as you want, 
after you've put 40 hours in at the office. In the office. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, he, he is quite something, an entrepreneur with a very creative mind. And uh, But here, here, here is one thing that is happening also that I, I want to mention, if, even, even just by, by name, so to speak, and that is AI and robotics. Because of the shortages of employees, more companies are adopting uh, automation. And automation is supposed to solve some of the issues and some of the problems of not finding a lot of bodies around the assembly line. So it happens everywhere. The more I read about it, the more astonished I am that it used to be automation in the automotive business, not anymore. I mean, in the old days, automation uh, got a big kick within the automotive industry. Car makers, automobile makers use a lot of automation, as we know, um, for efficiency purposes, cutting cost primarily. Uh, machine is not moody. Uh, doesn't take days off, doesn't get sick, and so on and so forth. So it, it was understandable. The pandemic created these shortages in labor. And as a result, companies, large and small, are heavily into automation. And part of it is because of the shortages of labor created by the pandemic. Um, so I, I mentioned banking is one, one, one way, one way to look at it, but also the fast food. This is unbelievable. Fast food, as you know, is labor intensive. And this is the bottom of the bottom in terms of entry level, you know, for employees. They got clobbered. They got clobbered by, by shortage, by, re, re, you know, resignations, turnover and what have you. And uh, um, I mean, McDonald's is experimenting right now with almost fully automated order system uh, for fast food and basically they, they eliminated in some of the models that they're experimenting with they eliminated all the front uh, desks so to speak employees within a little uh, place and uh, it just you have two guys in the back that are reading the orders and preparing the food and even even getting it out is done through uh, you know a convertible you know uh, so everything is automated. They're experimenting with it. Starbucks is looking heavy in, into it. I mean, think about it. It solves so many, many problems for them of scheduling and unexpected, you know, no show ups and turnover. I mean, machine does all of this 24-7. Uh, why not do it? Nobody want to admit it because it's going to cost uh, jobs. But think about the good thing that can come out of it is it's the upskilling, forcing people to go back to school, to get training, to learn new skills, whatever they are, so that you will not be easily replaced. Or if you move, you move up rather than out into a new role, into a new position and what have you. So th this, this is what's happening in the workplace today. And I think even if it started earlier, as you said earlier, you know, before the pandemic, it, it is more clearly, clearly we see the direction where things are moving uh, and got a boost because of the pandemic. Bad or good, it doesn't matter. It is a real trend that is happening. Automation. And I mentioned my, my chapter in the book and my articles in, in the site that I mentioned earlier. I provide a lot of statistics in support of each one of the 20 trends, uh, trends long-term trends that I that, that are listed. So we're, we're just not making things up in the air. They are anchored into real statistics, into real numbers, and anybody can look into it, go to the references we are using, have a better access to a specific aspect of these than what we can cover you know, in, in, in a 40-minute conversation. Let me ask you this as far, as far as a possible solution. And let, let me point back to Elon um, <clears throat> as an example with um, Tesla. Not we'll, we'll ignore SpaceX for a moment. So at Tesla, the management layers are very flat <clears throat> and they 
empower employees and teams to make changes. Uh, they, they are coordinated, but make changes and give them the authority to make those changes and make them very fast. They're also giving them access to stock and stock options to get them ownership in the process. So here is here are two prongs, control of, of the work environment and their work environment. And a lot of them can work across departments. They can, they can move into an area that they're interested in working in. Some of them don't even have to ask permission. So in financial incentives and buy-in uh, and ownership with control. Let me, and I'm experimenting with some of this too. Um, and a, a lot of this is sort of been intuitive, but let me just, let me check it out as a possible solution. Giving, giving people more say in how they do their job, um, focusing on teamwork and collaboration, giving opportunities to focus on excellence and continuous improvement so that they're, they don't ever reach a plateau if we're, if we're pushing to always make our processes more efficient, uh, take labor out, um, still shuffling the labor into, into other tasks, but also giving a sense of a clearer sense of purpose and participation in something greater than any of us <clears throat> individually. So maybe a, a greater sense of purpose and joint mission to feel more a part of it. <clears throat> is, is that part of the solution for today's uh -huh. worker? Yeah, I couldn't put it in better terms. That is a magnificent way to conceptualize happening. Absolutely. You know, if you go back to the, some of the old theories in management, particularly in the field of motivation, there is every job has extrinsic and, and intrinsic aspects. The ex extrinsic is everything that happens around it is working conditions. It's the wage wages uh, mm -hmm. level of, of pay and uh, other conditions and terms. The intrinsic part is everything that you as a human being derive from your job in terms of responsibility, <clears throat> satisfaction, um, you know, uh, decision-making ability, less control, freedom to think and experiment. I mean, the, and, and what is happening is, uh, is that, that uh, many companies overemphasize the extrinsic side of the job at the expense of what a person as a human being can derive the pleasure of doing, the pleasure of working, the, the pleasure of having the freedom to make the decisions, to make the corrections, you know, without being told by hierarchy above you. That by itself brought many companies to a flat structure. And you mentioned Elon Musk, you know, Tesla. Absolutely. A teamwork rather than a hierarchy of God only knows how many levels above you. Every level creates more bureaucracy, creates more paperwork, uh, uh, coordination challenges, communication problems, of course. You know, and in today's world, when you have to act and react fast, any company that has these old approaches will go belly up in a matter of time. So what you said is exactly the line of work that needs to guide management in today's office, when I say office company. Absolutely. And this is why 42% of people that resigned their job during the pandemic and found a new job say and say that they are not happy in their new place in their new office okay because they're exactly. bound they're, they're yes. in these silos uh, uh, either that or again 
companies think that if I pay a few extra dollars compared to the other guy down the street, I'll be able to retain these employees, and it's proven that this approach is is uh, his part of history, not a modern way, because people are looking for more than just a paycheck. They they gain a lot, and this this is exactly what you said links us to the very start of of this conversation about being loyal to your profession, your discipline, not to the company physically to the to the employer i'm working with. uh technology people you know it people are the best example they are loyal to to their job they are loyal to their discipline uh not to the company x or company y uh, and because of that they have long wings you know if if i'm not happy doing what i'm supposed to do here i will go down the street to another company and and do it because they appreciate me. They give me the freedom. They allow me to experiment. They don't punish me if I made a mistake. They use an error as a learning tool. So you see, this is it. I mean, I mean, uh, Mark, you define it in an excellent way, and that is exactly what is happening. And this is what I refer to a new contract between employer and employee. Is exact make the the job make the place more meaningful to employees don't think that by adding them a few hundred dollars you know per year you're going to retain them and keep them for good that is important but that's a baseline they want much more than that and if your job does not provide that if the environment of your company if the culture of your company does not give them that meaningful that intrinsic aspect of of the job they're not going to stay with you uh, you you talked about two other things that i think may be key one of them is about making mistakes um now some of the tech companies say encourage people you know let's break things let's you know so encouraging people to do it um i, I think another maybe in between approach is let's let's acknowledge that we're going to make mistakes <clears throat> but let's fix the ones that we've made and let's try to always make new mistakes <laughs> not not the same ones and then on the pushing forward what about always working to create new new services new products so that they're they're excited about seeing new things doing new processes building to be crass about it, building cool shit for for our customers. And then finally, let's stay focused on our customers, making them happy, making them whole. And let's all put our best effort and focus our energies on serving them the best way we can. That, Are those absolutely. also part of this puzzle? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. At 3M. Everybody heard about 3M, right? Minnesota-based, uh, huge company. A lot of things. That's the at least the old uh, 3M. You know, that was the philosophy of innovation, of being uh, innovative, uh, giving their 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 uh, people the freedom, x number of hours. Think about new project, and we pay you whether you are in the office or at home, in your garage, experimenting with, you know innovation powerful 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 uh you know force that propelled them to excel making 3m what it, what what they've been for many many years unfortunately you know with new ceo new change in strategy uh, they moved away from uh, the experimentation side to formalizing their processes and and focusing on exploitation rather than uh exploration so to speak, uh, and 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 that forced them to focus on uh, process management, all kind of new techniques, you know, of of uh, controlling mistakes and re reducing error rate of errors and what have you. And when a company focuses too much on the exploitation of data, of knowledge, of know how, rather than also do exploration creating new ideas new innovative products 
making mistakes because you learn from them. Yes, as a matter of policy, uh, you move away and you lose for the long term. And that's what happened to 3M. I really hope that they will change direction and get that trajectory of continuing to be a very innovative company rather than be bogged down in process management. Um, Six Sigmas and all this stuff that you probably know about them. All these, they are important. But if you overemphasize them, you take the life out of the ex exploration part. And that tension between exploitation and exploration is very, very important. By the way, one of my early papers dealt with the conflict, with the tension between and how to resolve it. And again, I invite if anybody in, uh, uh, that is watching here is interested, they probably can find that paper somewhere there in the site provided. So this is fascinating stuff. And obviously, you're on top of it and you see things uh, in, in, in the proper way. And I, I really hope that whoever is listening, if they are interested in that, they can dig deeply into it. But uh, all these dynamics are part of life, uh, part of, of companies, part of management today. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if there is any message that we can convey to is to pay close attention to them uh, rather than ignore them and, and hope that, uh, you know, uh, employees will continue to be on work for us for years to come. That is long gone. <laughs> right. Well, we could... I can already tell we could talk for hours about some of this because we haven't even gotten into the ramifications of AI, chat GPT, robotics with uh, Tesla planning to roll out a robot within the next, a, a working model within the next year or so. So let's do plan to, to talk again. But uh, as we wrap up here, give us ways to, to contact you again, and we'll put those in the show notes best ways to reach you um give email I, yeah. phone uh yeah, e web e e email definitely will be the easy and uh the best way i'm, I'm certainly and i'm good at responding uh to any email I, I i get you know that's just a philosophy of mine Coming no shortage of labor world. on your email right? <laughs> yeah so uh, s like in sam s malka just one word s malka s M A L K A at Sullivan S U L L I V A N dot com. Uh, in my dot response, com, not dot edu. Uh, dot I'm com. sorry, dot edu. I apologize. Dot edu. Okay. Oh, what did I say? Oh, definitely S Malka at Sullivan dot edu. Uh, and in my response to you, there will be a, a website at the bottom under my credentials. Uh, if you click on it, you'll have access to some of my uh, more recent papers, uh, books. And, um, uh, you know, if you're interested in books, you can, uh, again, Google the, the name and you will see it on uh, Amazon.com. Um, and I'll gladly address or an answer, you know, any questions that you may have or clarification, I will gladly uh, uh, address. Great. And anybody with Shalom as a first name, we need to schedule another podcast to talk about peacemaking. And I understood that you, you're you involved with conflict resolution and conflict management. So let's yes. definitely plan to do that as well. Super. I'll gladly do so. Thank you. So thanks again to Charles Malka for joining us today on the Thrive Co-Living Communities podcast. Uh, please look in the show notes. We'll put his contact information there. Um, you can also find out more about us at Thrive Co-Living Communities, plural, dot org. And we'll have different ways that you can support the podcast and our co-living plans uh, in the future. Thanks for joining us for another great episode of the Thrive Co-Living Communities YouTube podcast. To learn more about our mission and how you can support our vision of creating co-living communities worldwide, please visit us at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. To receive advanced viewings of our podcasts and other exclusive content, find us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash 
thrive co-living communities. You can also learn more ways to support our mission in the show notes below. Amazon Smile, GoFundMe, Kroger, and our own Thrive Gear store where you can buy t-shirts, hats, and many other items. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.